While the definition of racewalking is fairly concise, the nuances and complexities of efficient racewalking technique are far from simple. Watching elite walkers blaze by leaves you awestruck. It also leaves you with an image of textbook form that is fluid, powerful, and graceful. While many positive adjectives can replace those stated, they don't describe why race walkers look so good. The key to good form is a combination of strength and range of motion. But before we dive in, a brief note about our explanation. When we state average statistics, we are not simply making up numbers. We studied high frame rate video and sequence still photographs of many of the best walkers in the world. Our numbers are the average of those findings. Let's start our discussion with posture. Notice how a race walker's torso is in a vertical position. Historically, this wasn't always the case, with race walkers being coached to lean from the ankles. This led to a very sore lower back as well as restricted hip rotation. By walking tall, walkers' technique is more graceful and efficient. Their posture is one of the factors in why they can achieve the ideal of having a longer stride behind their body than in front of their body. Let's dissect the stride further by observing what happens as the leg completes its swing forward. As it straightens, the toes are pointed up between 20 to 30 degrees from the ground as measured along the sole of the shoe, and then the heel strikes the ground. Let's also note the position of the rest of the body. The right arm swings backward, coming up to an angle of 20 to 30 degrees. While for decades we've stated you should hold your arm at 90 degrees, most elite walkers hold theirs at an angle at slightly less than 90 degrees. The key is for your hand to swing to just behind the hip. If you're holding your arm at 85 degrees and it's not swinging back far enough, try opening your arm angle from 90 to 95 degrees. The variation can be for many reasons, including a difference in the ratio between your upper and lower arm. Finally note the ratio of the stride in front and behind the body. It should be roughly 30-70. How you measure it matters. In this case, we are measuring the front of the stride from the point of heel contact to the center of the torso, and the rear portion of the stride from the center of the torso to the point of toe off. Then the body moves forward over the left leg. This is where walkers tend to violate part of the definition of race walking. The leg must remain straightened until it's in the vertical position. Once the leg is beyond the vertical position, it may bend. However, when it comes time to lift your heel off the ground, if your leg is still straightened, you get an extra thrust by pushing off your rear foot. With proper flexibility and strength, your leg stays straightened longer and you obtain this advantageous thrust. Ideally, the leg remains straightened until the heel of the rear foot lifts off the ground. Then roll up onto the toe of your rear foot. Notice that as the rear leg leaves the ground, the front leg is already in position. Also note, as we observed earlier, that the legs do not create a symmetrical triangle. More of the stride is behind the body than in front. This is achieved through proper hip action, which is explained shortly. Next, we observe the left leg as it swings forward. The goal is for the foot to swing forward as low to the ground as possible. This averts loss of contact problems that may occur if you drive your foot too high coming through your stride. If your foot is too high, you might have a propensity to drive the leg up instead of forward thus making you a risk for visible loss of contact and getting disqualified. Watch the progression of the rear foot as it leaves the ground until just after the same foot strikes the ground in front of the body. Let's look at that portion of the stride again. When the rear foot leaves the ground, it swings forward with the leg flexed at the knee. Note the constant angle between the upper and lower leg during this phase. When a race walker begins straightening the leg, the quadriceps are used to extend it. When the foot makes contact with the ground, the leg must be straightened and no longer flexed at the knee. Let's look at a race walker from above. Notice how their footfalls land in a straight line. A pedestrian walker, in contrast, has footfalls on either side of a straight line. If you told a pedestrian walker to speed up, their footfalls would naturally land closer to the center line. This is because of the added engagement of their hips. The more a walker's hips engage, the more the walker's feet will land in a straight line. If we look at a walker from the front, we will also notice that the feet do not come down flat. Instead, they land on the outer corner of the heel and progress forward slowly with a natural roll to the outside of the foot. This is not forced and something to notice more than actively pursue. 
Finally, we can look at the walker from the back and see how the foot progresses forwards. We can see the foot rolling forward up onto the big toe. Once the walker toes off the ground, the foot comes forward as low to the ground as possible and not swaying out further than it has to. Elite race walkers generate their primary source of forward locomotion from rotating the hips forward. Repeatedly pivoting the hips forward causes them to act as the body's motor, propelling it forward one step at a time. Actively swinging the hips forward lengthens the stride from the top of the legs, while increasing stride length behind the body. In a flexible race walker, the gain can be as much as 3 inches per stride. If you add as little as 1 inch to a typical 1 meter race walking stride, the net gain is approximately 10 meters per lap on a track. In a 20 kilometer race, that totals to over 500 meters gained. At an elite level, the savings is close to 2 minutes. In the last three Olympic Games, it's made the difference between a gold medal and finishing well off the podium. An efficient race walker has more of their stride behind their body than in front. This is directly due to hip rotation. Good forward hip rotation is the key to solid race walking technique. The value of pursuing increased stride length was illustrated when Tim Seaman trained with Jefferson Perez, the 1996 Olympic champion and 2008 Olympic silver medalist. They measured their stride lengths and found that while Jefferson is shorter than Tim, Jefferson's stride length was 1.2 meters and Tim's was only 1.11 meters. That corresponds to Tim having to take 18,000 steps in a 20 kilometer race, while Jefferson only has to take 16,000. Some coaches tout that increasing hip rotation decreases a race walker's cadence. This is an inaccurate evaluation of biomechanics. The hips rotate forward at the same time as the leg swinging forward. The leg does not swing forward before the hip rotates. Since the two motions occur simultaneously, any reduction in cadence is minimal and greatly outweighed by the increase in stride length. The exact motion of the hips during race walking is a bit complicated. The hip moves in three dimensions, but its primary movement is forward. It also moves slightly in and out as well as up and down. To further understand proper technique, observe the hip motion from varying perspectives. A small circular sticker on the outside of the center of the hip is a great way to observe how the hip moves forward as the walker progresses through the stride. We start with the center point of the left hip as the race walker plants their heel on the ground. As the body moves forward over the straightened leg, the center point of the hip rises until the straightened leg passes directly beneath the body. From the moment when the leg passes under the body until the right foot's toe pushes off the ground, the center point of the hip moves downwards. As the rear foot starts to swing forward, the leg must be bent. This bent leg swings forward as the hip continues to lower slightly. This is known as hip drop and while necessary is a minimal action. After the knee of the swing leg passes under the body, the center point of the hip rises to the neutral position. Let's now look at the center point of the left hip of the race walker's stride as viewed from the side while the race walker is on a treadmill. The walker's heel strikes the ground as the center point of the hip is in the neutral position. As the treadmill carries the straightened leg backwards, the center point of the hip rises. From the moment when the straightened leg passes under the body until the right foot's toe pushes off the treadmill, the center point of the hip moves down. As the rear foot begins to move forward, the leg must be bent. While it does, the hip continues to lower. This is known as hip drop. After the knee of the swing leg passes under the body, the center point of the hip rises to its starting position for heel strike. Finally, to show how the hip arcs out slightly at different parts of the stride, observe a walker from the top view. Note that the outward sway is minimal and not a forced action. Instead, the hip sways out or in due to the forces subjected to it by the legs, arms, and torso. As the walker's right foot is about to leave the ground, the right hip is behind the body and begins moving forward. As it does, the left hip arcs out slightly. Once the right hip swings under the body, the right hip continues forward while the left hip arches inward and back to the starting position. The process is repeated when the left leg swings forward and the right hip arches outward and back to the neutral position. Even after a technical explanation, 
many beginning walkers still do not know what it should feel like to race walk with proper hip motion. When Tim and I teach race walking clinics, we resort to analogies to try to get a walker to engage their hips properly. Vampire in a coffin. Even though you may not feel like you're using your hips when you race walk, you are to a minimal extent. Our goal is to get you to feel what rotating your hips feel like. Try this exercise, preferably at the base of a hill. Place your hands over the chest as a vampire would in a coffin. Start race walking up the hill. Make sure you use proper technique in your lower body and straighten your leg appropriately. Race walk up the hill for 50 feet or so. Now accelerate your race walk. You should feel a slight tugging in your hips as it naturally begins to rotate forward. Go with the feeling. Gunslinger analogy. One analogy is to think of yourself as a gunslinger in the Old West with a pistol on each hip. Imagine you want to walk through a set of saloon doors that have a gap in the middle. However, you're not going to push the doors open with your hand. Instead, keeping your torso as still as possible, swing your right hip forward so the gun pops the door forward, then repeat it with the left hip. Use the same motion when you race walk and lead your leg forward from the hip. An elite race walker synchronizes arm and hip motion to maximize efficiency and speed. While the exact range of motion of the arms varies slightly with speed and effort, each arm travels from a couple of inches behind the hip to just above the chest line. Notice how when the arm swings forward, the wrist is positioned above the ankle. The primary power for arm movement is derived from the backward swing of the arm. It's not a wild pumping action and does not require much effort to thrust the arm forward. The shoulders need to be relaxed, allowing the shoulder to act as a fulcrum with the arm swinging like a pendulum. With the proper arm angle, when you drive back, the arm swings to the proper position at a few inches behind your hip. With a relaxed shoulder, your arm recoils forward to the correct location. You'll be surprised how little effort is required to keep your arm moving quickly but note that your arms can only move as fast as your hips and legs. It's all about synchronicity. Observe closely and you can see how the shoulders and torso move slightly forward as the opposite hip rotates forward. As the walker's left foot makes contact with the ground, their right shoulder moves slightly in front of their left. You can also notice the forward presence of the right side of their torso as it counters the left hip's forward progression. Proper arm swing must also take into account how the arm crosses in front of the body. Observe how the arm swings forward as if shaking someone's hand. One key to good arms is to relax the shoulders. While the shoulders do move slightly forward and back, countering the walker's hip rotation, they should remain relatively still. Also observe the height of your shoulders and check whether they're relaxed. Since you won't be carrying a ruler, simply place one hand on your shoulder and lower it as far down as it can go. When your shoulder is all the way down, it is relaxed. 